Chip, what's up, man? It's good to see you. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been on my own podcast, which is kind of weird, but here I am <laughs> back in a, in a diminished form. Yeah. Before the numbers got too low, you thought, you know what, maybe I should try to, you know, correct this ship and uh, get involved. So then that way this doesn't all go to hell. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about calling in sick again today, but I figured, you know what, I can't do three no shows. I gotta, I gotta be here. Yeah. You're like, uh, my pet hurting doesn't justify me not losing the talk, losing the business. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's you guys, you did uh, one with Sean, which was great. And then it was really cool to have Drew and you on last week. You guys did a great job. So I'm never concerned when I, ha- in fact, I think they're always better when other people are coming in and giving their perspective. Everybody knows what mine is. Um, so to have other people come in and give their insight, I think is really cool. I don't always agree with everything that's being said, but who agrees with everything? That'd be strange if that were the case. Totally. Well, and, and we evolve and we change and who knows, like, and that's, what's kind of funny and the unfortunate part, I'm assuming from your perspective, because I mean, you've been podcasting now for how long? Six? Uh, well, almost seven years with order of man, but almost eight years. If you count my podcast yeah. before that, I mean, that's and to say, if your opinions are the same as when you started seven years ago, it's like, then you haven't grown as, a, as an individual. It is always interesting because occasionally I will get somebody who will say, well, you know, you're saying this, but last year, and they'll take a screenshot of something I said, and they'll say, last year, you said this, bro, that was la- that was 12 months ago. Of course, I would hope, hope that I'm saying something different than I am 12 months later, you know, and it, and it might actually conflict with the thought that I had 12 months ago. And I never understood that about politics. I know there's flip-flopping where you have somebody who's just going to flip-flop based on who they're talking with. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is when politicians quite literally change their opinion and perspective for, for the, for better or worse, like people are going to change. That doesn't mean they're a flip-flopper. It just means they may look at things differently now. And it's, really our job to decipher whether or not what they're saying today, whether it's a politician or me is still in line with what you believe and still something that is aspirational for you. But to try to pin people into a box and and assume that they can never change. That's interesting to me. Yeah. Well, I think it illustrates the natural human behavior for us to pigeonhole people by default, because there's a sense of prediction, predictability, and there's a sense of comfort to be able to pigeonhole you and understand where you are. And for you to go change that up on me, it's like, well, that disrupts my perception of you and my ability to predict how you're going to react to things. And, and I, it's just a natural human tendency to, and that's why we judge so easily. That's why we kind of pigeonhole people, I think, is because there's a sense of security and understanding where people uh, stand on on particular issues and being able to predict how they might respond to something. And well, like everything else we say, just because it's human nature doesn't necessarily mean it's the ideal state. And we need to be mindful that we do that naturally, kind of. I'm, I'm glad that you explained it further, because when you said pigeonhole, if that's all you say, it almost makes it sound like there's some sort of devious intent. And I think for the overwhelming majority of the time, there really isn't. I I really don't think people are trying to, to be ill intent with it. It's just, like you said, it's human. It threatens me. If you change and I attach some sort of my worth or my self identity up in what you think, and whether you believe it or not, those of you who listen to order of man, are doing that. Yeah. And you might say, I'm not doing, no, you, you are to varying degrees, just like I do it. When I listen to Andy Frisilla or Jocko's podcast, I tie up some of my own sense of worth or, or who I am into what those guys are saying, because I resonate with what they're saying. And so when they change, it threatens how I view myself. And that's scary for a lot of people, for everybody. Well, and we see this even in how many times have we gotten a question on this podcast where some individual is getting on the path of personal development and change. Maybe they've joined us in the iron council. They're making necessary adjustments and there's some resistance. 
There's resistance from spouses, from family members, from friends. It's a very natural process for people to resist that change because to your point, it shakes up the foundation of how they may perceive themselves as well as the comfort and how they perceive their relationship with you. Yeah. Well, I think it's just something to be very, very aware of so that we can realize what we are naturally inclined to do and then rebel against it and say, no, I am going to change and I am capable of evolving. And I do see this issue differently than I saw it a year ago. And that's okay. You don't need anybody's permission to do that. You don't need to run it by anybody else. You don't, you, you, you are well within your rights and who you are. In fact, I think it's a responsibility to evolve your thought process. So totally, totally. And I think there's power in understanding human behavior. So when you get resistance, it's not, it's not, you don't think that it's ill intent to your point earlier and you realize, oh, okay, I understand why they're maybe pushing back and why I'm getting resistance because I'm shaking things up and that's okay. And over time, there's going to, you know, there's going to be a a progression in regards to your reputation or how you're viewed by those individuals. So there's a great quote, this, this, there's a great quote. This reminds me of, it's not exact, but it still reminds me of the quote. And it says, never attribute to maliciousness, what should be attributed to stupidity. <laughs> like <laughs> most people, most people, most people aren't malicious. They're just dumb and ourselves yeah. included, you know? Yeah. So yeah, they're just ignorant to this situation. <laughs> That's, it. That's, That's it. funny. That's funny. <laughs> so, uh, you, you're strapping, you know, you got a rifle yeah. over your shoulder I'm, during the podcast I'm today. <laughs> I'm strapped. I rip, I rip my sleeve, my arm, my biceps are too big. So I rip my sleeve. <laughs> yeah. A lot of guys know I finally, bit the bullet and had this surgery. Um, I, so what I ended up having, I don't know if I even told you, so it was a, we did the MRI. It's a, it's a complete pectoral tendon rupture. So basically the pec, the pectoral muscle, and it's the major, I think there's the major and then the minor, the major completely separated from the bone and the the humerus, I think this is so completely separated from the bone. So what they do is they go in and they drilled into my bone three holes and then they added like buttons or something is the way they described it. And then they take the tendon and the muscle and they pull it over and they stretch it and they hook it to those buttons. And then over time it will heal. So I'm supposed to be in this for six weeks and then rehab PT, all that kind of stuff will take anywhere from three to four months. But when you say heal, the, the buttons are in the drilling in the bone will always be there or will that will as far as I understand, there? that's a good question. I was actually thinking about that yesterday. I, I actually don't know the answer to that question, whether they just dissolve or go away or they're small enough where the tendon just grows around it, but the tendon will eventually connect back to the bone. To the bone. Okay. Yeah. Which is ideal. Obviously that's what you want. And I don't know if they'll just grow around the buttons or those buttons just dissipate. I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that question. Yeah. I I know that you're drugged up pretty good. I I sent you a text message and I'm like, Hey, how did the surgery go? And you're you're like, I'm feeling groovy is what I think. (laughs) I'm like, I'm feeling groovy. And then I, and then I went straight business and I'm like, Hey, here's an idea, blah, blah, blah. And then your reply back is I don't understand. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, you know what? I shouldn't be trying to, (laughs) <laughs> talk details with a drugged up uh, individual. I'll, I'll yeah. wait until you're sober. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm not drugged up right now. Uh, I, I don't even have, like, I haven't even taken Advil or Tylenol or ibuprofen. Like I haven't taken any of that. They gave me some narcotics. They gave me, um, yeah. Oxycodone is what they gave me, but I haven't taken it. Not because I'm opposed to it. I, I'm not, yeah. um, but you're it's, like, it's, I, it's, I'll take it if I need to. If I need to, and I haven't, because I was telling you before we hit record, they gave me a nerve blocker. So they did a ultrasound and they, I could actually see the needle going into my, into my shoulder. And basically it's, it, it, that's what it is. It blocks the sensory nerves and it blocks the movement nerves. So for the past three days, cause I had my surgery on Thursday and it's Monday as we record this, uh, I, I haven't been able to feel or move my arm. I can, today's the first day I can really feel it. And yeah. it's not unbearable. That sucks, man. I, I, I actually feel for you. Cause I mean, I don't know. I, I, I have a tendency not to appreciate my health until something slightly gets wrong. Like I hurt my knee or, or something. And then all of a sudden I'm just like, 
uh, it's just frustrating not to be able to do what you love to do, right? Whether it's working out or jujitsu and other things, it's, I don't know. That's going to be the hardest part is not training for three months, three to four months. Yeah. That's going to be hard. I, t- I'm going to go to training tonight. I'm not going to, obviously I'm not going to train, but I'm going to go and just stretch. I can still move. I can stretch. I can watch. I can observe. So I'm going to go tonight. And plus I want to be around the guys, you know, that's good for me. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'll go, but yeah, it's going to be a long process. I'm kind of disappointed, you know, just sitting around, even just having my wife help me put my shirt on just feels absolutely ridiculous. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, um, well, humbling. How's that? At least it's humbling. humbling. Definitely humbling for sure. Yeah. Cool. And I'll come back better because I will realize the real consequence of doing stupid things. So <laughs> copy. All yeah. right, let's get into some questions. Yeah. So we're fielding questions today from the Iron Council. Uh, to learn more about the IC, go to orderman.com slash iron council. We're going to be open for what? A couple more days or into this week? Yeah, What's your thoughts? Three, three more days. So Friday, we're shutting it down. So it's Wednesday as the release of this podcast. So today, Thursday and Friday, and then it's done. It's closed. So yep. if you want in, you got to get in now. Yep. Orderman.com slash Iron Council. All right. Let's 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 fill these questions. Kirk uh, Blevins uh, from Team Whiskey. Guys, a topic came up this past week in the battle team discussions that hit me hard. It revolves around who could be provide fatherly advice and demonstrate what a true man is to your children if you were to pass away. We have a network of men within the Iron Council that would come close to meeting our own standards for our children, but much less and conceivable, no men in our locality. What steps have each of you taken to assure that true men would be available to demonstrate the qualities you want your children to see and learn from? What advice would you give to the men out there? I, I think question. what we have to do is it is, I really like this question. I never, I don't know that we've ever been asked this question, No, but I think you need to look at your sphere of influence. So when it comes to your kids and specifically you're talking about your sons, you should be their greatest sphere of influence. You, right. And if yeah. you're gone, that's what you're talking about. Then who's next? Well, hopefully it would be an uncle like cousins, a, a grandfather that that's ideal. Ideally, that's who it'd be. It'd be uncles and grandfathers would come in and they would take over in, in your stead. And to that point, you need to make sure that you're going out of your way to maintain and build and develop the relationships with your, your, your brothers, your stepbrothers, your, your in-laws, your, your father, your grandfathers, like you need to be fostering and managing those relationships with your sons and daughters too. So that if something ever were to happen, there isn't going to be a lull or a gap. We, we just got off the phone yesterday evening uh, with my, my in-laws. So it's my wife's parents and my father-in-law. So, so my kids is grandfather. We're talking about fishing and they can't wait to have them come out and go fishing again. And they're at the cabin and what fun they were having and hunts that they're going on. And I thought to myself, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Like the fact that they have that relationship and they have that connection and I don't view it as a threat. Sometimes fathers do. I don't view it as a threat. I I view it as a value add to my children means that there's going to be less of a gap. If for some reason I passed away prematurely. Yeah. So that's the next sphere of influence. Then the next would be your friends. Uh, and I, I think that would include neighbors. I think that would include uh, clergy, church members, uh, f- friends, that sort of thing. And I, I'm in the position where we're surrounded by a lot of good men who are very connect. You're, you're, you're part of that, Kip. Yeah. Other people who are deeply connected and intertwined with our family. Pete Roberts is somebody. Um, Joe Parody, who's Pete's father-in-law, but also a good friend of mine, where these guys would come in and serve my family. I have no doubt that they would do that. Brody Cousineau is another one. They would absolutely 100% take my children under their wing. But you know what? I foster those relationships. In fact, I encourage my kids to go do things not with other grown men, but in that environment, right? So If Brody calls up and he's like, Hey, I'm taking the boys fishing. Does Brecken want to come? I'm like, yes, he does want to go so that he can go be with his friends, but he can be around other men that aren't me that still have the same values, still men I trust. And, and again, it's all about fostering those relationships. So just look at your spheres of influence, you family, friends, and outwards from there. 
Totally. I don't share this from a perspective of like thinking, let me just say this. I think it's a good measuring stick when this conversation comes up with friends. I actually have a friend that they've communicated to my wife and I that if they were to pass away, they'd want us to raise their kids. It's awesome. It's powerful. What a honor. Yeah. And to be frank, I was just like, really? Like, man, like I, I really like took that to heart and it really forced even Asia and I to have that conversation of like, Hey, where do our kids go? Where would we want them to go to? And so have the conversation. Ryan, you said something that I think is profound. How, how do you, how do you not be threatened by these other men in their lives? Cause you mentioned that, right? It's like establishing these relationships. And you mentioned that some men do get threatened right? By your son, possibly looking up to a coach or looking up to a friend, another man. And some guys might be here in this conversation with that idea that they might be threatened. Where does that come from? Or what do we need to do? Or how do we need to show up to mitigate that concern that might block some guys from establishing these kind of relationships? You really need to consider what your ultimate objective is as a father. And how do you measure success? So I look at fatherhood like this and there it's nuanced and there's a lot of factors that come into play, but if we strip all of that away, it's my job to render myself obsolete. That means that if my children can go out into the world and they can be self-sustaining, they can be value add to their communities and their families and their friends, uh, they can support and they can grow and they can have jobs and they can make money and they can have experiences and they can contribute and share with other people. Then I feel like I've done my job. Well, I don't consider it my job as a father to feel good about this fatherhood thing. Like doing it for, from a, uh, they like selfish me kind of standpoint, mentality. right? If I'm, if I measured my performance as a father, based on how good I feel about the job I'm doing, then I'm going to be more threatened by somebody else stepping in and adding something to my son's or daughter's life. But again, because I measure my standard of fatherhood and fathering as rendering myself obsolete, then I'm already looking for ways to render myself up today. So when my, my kids, my two oldest boys, they go to uh, powerlifting three days a week with coach Sean Moore, I'm not threatened by Sean. In fact, when they come, I used to be a little bit, I will say that, but cause they'd come back and they're like, yeah. well, you know, he does this and this and this, and I'm, you know, I got sick of hearing about it, but, but now I'm like, no, that's, I actually edify Sean. I talk favorably about Sean to my boys. So when they say, yeah, coach had me doing X, Y, and Z. I'm like, well, that's great. He's a good coach. Listen to him. He's going to lead you right. He's going to steer you in the right direction. He's going to take care of you. Because again, I need to render myself obsolete. You can't get all of your advice and inputs about life from me. If you do, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. So it's, it's how you define what your role is that's going to determine your behavior towards that objective. Love it. Sam Broadway, if you hosted an Order of Man event on your property for men and their sons, and a man showed up with a transgender kid, biological daughter trying to be a boy, how would you approach the situation? <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad that he brought this question up. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, because I saw these questions. I, no, I was like, thinking, we, yeah. should, I, should I broach this topic? Should I not? Should, no, I should broach this topic. And I thought a lot about how I would handle that. And here's, here's how I would handle it. I would approach that man in private and I would ask him to leave. And I know that's not going to be a favorable thing. I know people aren't going to like that. Uh, What if feelings get hurt and they might, but it's not appropriate for a girl, a young woman to be at our event for fathers and sons. Bottom line. And so here's what I would do. So I would, I would approach that father in private, you know, privately, this could be a private question. I'd say, if if I knew that was the case, I'd say, Hey, you know, I'm going to have to ask you to, to not participate. I'm going to refund your, your, your ticket cost for the event. And I'm going to help you. I'm going to help cover flights. Like I'm going to go out of my way to make sure you guys are, I'm not going to put you out and, and explain and have, have the conversation. Yeah. That's a, that is a young woman. That's not appropriate for a young woman to be at an event for 
young boys. It's just not, this is not a co-ed event. This is an event for fathers and sons. And I know people say, well, she's trying to become a boy. And this, it, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. She is a biological woman, young woman. And that's the end of it, period. So I, it's really hard because most people won't say that. And that's not even going to be a popular answer. But that's what we need. We need people who are actually willing to stand by their convictions. So I will have every bit of empathy that I can for that father and his daughter. I will be there to help support and, and, and do what I can, but not at the expense of our mission. And that puts our mission at risk. And I'm not willing to do that. Yeah. And I feel you said something, you said that most people wouldn't say this, but, but do you think that most people would agree though? Or, I mean, I, I guess I do it doesn't think necessarily that. matter, but I do actually I do think, think most people would agree. They just wouldn't say it in fear of backlash probably. Yeah. That's, but that's the, that's one of the biggest problems. Yeah. The fact that I even contemplated not even addressing this question is part of the problem. Yeah. We actually need to be talking about these things because these are real issues that we need to deal with and we need to confront and we need to discuss and we don't have to agree. You don't have to like what I believe, but that's what I think. And I'm going to stand by it. Yeah. Adam Lewis, with all the contention around the repeal of Roe versus Wade, new title, uh, transports and so on. How can we as men of example have productive conversations when many don't want to follow boundaries and other structures besides just avoiding them? I have worked to just avoid those types of people because of the um, aforementioned issues that seems to almost be unavoidable anymore. Well, you use the, the, the excuse me, the term productive um, conversations. You can't have productive conversations with people who don't want to have productive conversations. Yeah. It's like a dance. There's at least two partners in the dance and yeah. It's got to be somewhat choreographed, you know, maybe a little freestyle when you're talking about conversation, but there are rules, right? And there's, there's rules that we both have to agree, whether they're spoken or unspoken, there's rules to conversation. And if you're not willing to play by my rules, then I'm not going to dance. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And I might have to explain the rules to somebody. Let's say I wanted to have a conversation with you and you started crossing over some boundaries that I had in place. I feel like I would owe it to you to at least communicate what those boundaries are and explain to you the rules. Kip, here's how I expect this conversation to go. You're not going to attack me personally. You're not going to name call. You're not going to shout and scream and be emotional and irrational. And if you are, then you can do that on your own and I'm out. Yeah. Or if you'd like to have a rational, real discussion, I'm happy to do that with you. So I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I had made a post um, about... My, my wife and I have been married. We celebrated uh, over the weekend, 18 years of marriage. Congrats, by the way. Thank you very much. And I said that we waited to have sex before marriage. And when we wanted to have sex, but we weren't ready for kids, we used timing and we used contraception. Yeah. And now we have four kids, all of them planned for, all of them wanted, all of them loved. And obviously, um, and I put in the caption, planned parenthood, <laughs> you know, like I know how to get a rise out of people and I, and I do that, yeah, but yeah. I believe what I say, You're making and, a and point. Yeah. Right. And I believe what I'm sharing. And, you know, I had a guy talk, he says, well, what about cases of rape and incest is what he said. And I've been playing the game long enough that I know when people are trying to play games and trying to paint you into a corner. So I wrote back and said, I'll tell I said, if, if there was an exception for rape and incest and uh, life risk to the mother, yeah, would course. you then, would you then support an abortion ban for everything, but those exceptions? And he wrote back, no, I'm not going to answer that question until you answer my question. And I said, no, you, I think you're playing a game and I'm not willing to answer that question until I believe that your question is sincere. So if you want to answer that question, then I'll go ahead and answer yours. Well, no, you should answer mine. Cause I look, <laughs> I'm the one that has that's having the conversation. So are you, 
I have rules I'm playing by. If you don't want to abide by those rules, I don't play. Okay. If I'm not abiding by your rules, you don't have to play. There's nowhere written that says that I'm obligated to engage in conversation that I don't like the direction of. And those people will use all sorts of little tricks. They'll attack you. They'll mock you. Um, they'll, they'll attempt to undermine you. They'll misrepresent arguments. They'll resort to ad hominem attacks. Like they'll do all sorts of things to try to engage you in the conversation. But at the end of the day, if the rules aren't played by your rules, just don't play the game. Yeah. Because there are plenty of people and there were actually in this post, it was fairly respectful in this post, which I was surprised about. There was some comments, but that's bound to happen. But the overwhelming majority, even in dissent of what I had said, were very respectful. And I'm willing to engage in that conversation. And I was very respectful to everybody who commented, whether they agreed with me or not, or were rude or not. I was very respectful. I made it a point to be that way. Um, and I'm willing to have those conversations if you abide by those rules. There's plenty of people out there who will have conversations in a mature, rational way. So there's just no reason to waste time on those who aren't interested. Yeah. Well, and I think it's powerful, kind of what we were talking about earlier is understanding intent and human behavior. I can't help even last night, I, or actually this morning when I was working out, this thought entered my mind. It's, it's funny how you can take a polarizing conversation or, you know, whether it's politically charged or, you know, whatever, social issue, whatever that particular item might be. And we take people's emotional response, like their strong emotional response as a sign of importance of the issue. In reality, it's the opposite. What's really happening, if you're emotionally charged, Ryan, over a conversation that you and I are having, why are you emotionally charged? Is it because it's really important to you? No. Most cases, when we get emotionally charged something, it's because it's a very selfish, like what it means about you. That's why, that's why you get fired up. That's why your adrenaline gets rushed. That's why we people often start leaning in the direction of attacking other individuals because it's not about the issue. It's actually about something else. And AKA, it's a little illogical. And the conversation is not about the issue. It's now about me validating my opinion and you disrupting, you know, and, and if you're making that issue wrong in my eyes, then it's a reflection of me. And now we're not even talking about the issue anymore. Now we're just yeah. talking about you feeling good about yourself. Yeah. And or winning the argument, right? You'll hear yeah. like people just want to win the argument. I look, here's a, here's the bottom line. I actually don't care about some things. You know, I'll make a post about, abortion or transgender, just since we're talking about these issues or gun rights or whatever, right? Whatever the topic is. And inevitably there'll be one or two people who'll be like, well, you know, you're addressing this, but what about the starving kids in Ethiopia? Like we have bigger problems to worry about. I'm like, well, how about you worry about that problem then? Yeah. I, I'm like picking this problem. Yeah. Right. I can't address all the problems that, that the entire world faces at any given time, nor do I want to, nor do I care about every problem. Like some problems just aren't on my radar, whether it's because I'm ignorant to them or they're just not important. Or alternatively, I have resources, a finite amount of resources, and I have to direct them towards the problem of men, the problem of raising young men, the problem of masculinity in society. And so that's where I'm going to direct my attention. And it doesn't mean that other problems are less important. I would just encourage you to deal with those problems because the world needs all of the problems addressed and I can only address so many. So you do yours and I'll do mine. And then uh, the 8 billion people on the planet, hopefully collectively through our combined efforts can solve a lot of the problems we're dealing with. Yeah. I mean, let's be frank, right? The, the difference is they're not addressing any problem. They just have an, an opinion about a problem. Right. <laughs> and, Which is fine. Are they actually doing something about it? And, right. and the difference is those that are actually doing something about a problem, choose a problem. Those right. that, oh, I'm going to focus on all these problems. They're not doing anything. They're just running in their mouths and, and they're right. like, you know, their social media post is quote unquote, them helping to address a problem. Let's be frank. Yeah, I agree. And there's all sorts of ways to address problems. Uh, you know, I think about sex, uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking. Uh, and I, two people that come to mind are Tim Tebow um, and Tim Ballard. Yeah. You know, the, that those are not my 
those are not my issues. I realize they're important. I'm not saying they're not, they're extremely important. Those guys are doing a phenomenal job. So I give them my platform to be able to talk about it. I send them financial resources so they can continue to fight that. And I engage in a way that's meaningful for me. Now I'm probably not going to be the next, you know, CEO or president of their nonprofit, but I can send them a few bucks every month. You know, I can have one of them on my podcast to talk about the issues they're dealing with and ask questions and give them a bigger platform. So, I mean, we can help in all sorts of different ways. Just find a way that's meaningful for you. Yeah. Kind of in lines with, with that question, a tad Johnny Loretti, he asked, how does a man allocate his efforts across his sphere of influence, personal, family, local community, and the larger community in regards to big topic issues? So really maybe some tips around allocating his efforts across those spheres. I wish I could give you a formula. I don't know what it is, but this goes back to what I was saying earlier about sphere of influence. The greatest amount of my resources, that's my time, energy, capacity, money, is focused on where it can be leveraged the most. So if I'm going to put $10,000 towards something, that $10,000 is going to go into this business because that's where it's going to be leveraged the most. I have the biggest platform. I know what I'm talking about. I have all the technology in place. I have the connection secured. That $10,000 is going to be spent significantly better here than it might be with ABC organization over there. And that's not to say, again, that that's not important, but I might throw $1,000 at ABC organization and $10,000 towards, towards this organization. You really just have to feel, feel it. Um, I'll have people reach out all the time who will say, Hey, Ryan, I've got, I had a friend of mine. He reached out. He's like, Hey, we've got this young kid. Uh, he's in, um, jujitsu and he's a good competitor. And I really think he could do something, but he comes from a home where they don't have a lot of money. Can you contribute? You know, and I would have liked to have contributed a thousand dollars or something to him. And I, I messaged the guy and I said, Hey man, I really appreciate you want me to contribute. I can give him a hundred bucks and I hope that helps. You know, it's not a lot, but I hope it helps him. And I said, the majority of where I put my money goes into my community because yeah. this is where I live. And these are the young men and young women who are important, more important. I'm trying to figure out the way to say it. They're just, it's just there's no good way to say it. More just important focus, or higher priority. Yeah. Just a, it's just where I can be more effective with it. And so I, you know, I sent that young man a hundred dollars and I hope other people do too. And I hope he's successful and he, he takes off with his career and it really leads him onto a good path. Uh, and so I feel like I did my part. I couldn't do as much as I would have liked, but you know, you do what you can and you let the chips fall where they may. But I think you got to really spend some time prioritizing what's important to you and then learning to be good with letting other people, you know, here's one thought too, is even with what we're doing with this organization, order of man, we are really empowering men to go out and serve their communities we are empowering men to make more money so they can give back. We are empowering men to get a hold of their financial resources so they have more time to be able to serve within their communities. So that's pretty powerful knowing that we're leveraging all of this information so guys can go out and serve in a meaningful way. That's kind of cool. Yeah, totally. Dustin Kin, my wife and I have been separated for six months now. Things fell apart about a month into our marriage. There has been unfaithfulness on both sides, but I don't want to give up and I'm three months sober. How do I show up in our relationship when she is cold and distant? Man, there's a lot of red flags here. Ooh. Like more so than a typical separation. Six months is a long time. That's a long and separation. Fell and one apart month within a month. Yeah. Yeah. That those two things combined probably make me think differently of this situation than I would normally think. I don't know how long you guys were together beforehand. I don't know if you have kids. You didn't mention kids. So I'm assuming you don't. I think you would have mentioned that if that was the case. Um, I, I would really ask if she wants to be in this relationship at all. I mean, I hate to say that. I really do. I want it to work out. And so what I would tell you to do is to focus on your friends and family your job, your career. And so when I, so let me back up. No, let me say it like this. Friends and family, job and career, your fitness and um, different pursuits that are bigger than yourself. Those are the four things that I would say that you should focus on. So let's break those down. Friends and family, 
you should develop good, strong friendships with high caliber men, and you should work on shoring up relationships that you have with your family. <clears throat> Career-wise, you should develop new skills and, and learn how to manage your money better and start getting promotions or maybe start a side job or a side hustle uh, or, or a, a business. With your fitness, lock in your, your nutrition, lock in your exercise. And then with that last component is contributing, giving back is learning how to become a man of value. So coaching a little league team, um, doing a big brothers, big sisters type program, serving at your local community center, uh, whatever that looks like, finding a way to give back. If you focus on those four things, man, at that point, you can almost just let the chips fall where they may. And it's either going to work or it's not. So that's what I would say to focus on for yourself. But what I would also probably do in your situation is I would have a real good, honest look and discussion with her about the viability of this relationship. Yeah. A month into it, you had problems. She's got fidelity issues. You've got fidelity issues. You've been separated for six months. I don't know if she's still sleeping around or if you are. But there's some real big problems here. And the last thing I would want to have happen is for you two to feel like, oh, maybe we should try to make it work. And you try to make it work. And then you have a kid together. And then it all falls apart in 13 or 18 months. Totally. This, I hate to say it. I don't, in fact, I don't even know if it's right. But I just see red flags all over this situation where maybe it's not actually supposed to be this way. <clears throat> when my wife and I went through our separation, the way it was different for us is we were together for five years at that point. Uh, we, we had been dating for, for two years. We had a kid. Like there was some other reasons that I had to make sure it worked. This is different to me. I, does it seem different to you? Totally. I mean, in that short amount of time, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, there's red flags around the fidelity side. There's, there's red flags of a month in, right? Like yeah. you guys aren't even ready for this. Right. I mean, don't get me wrong. I remember the first couple of months of marriage. I was like, Holy yeah, shit, nobody's ready. This is super hard. <laughs> right. But in the same breath, your guys' willingness to throw up your hands that quickly is obviously maybe you guys aren't in a position yet for this level of commitment and something that important. And the only reason why you're, quote unquote, unwilling to give it up is maybe out of fear or some other means, right? So I'd get really connected to why don't you want to call it quits? I mean, let's be frank. You guys have called it quits. You have, I mean, you want to be cheating on her and vice versa if you guys were committed to each other. So you're obviously not committed. So the question is, is why are you even considering it? And where's that rooted in? We don't know that answer. Obviously you would, but- and we're making assumptions too, Tons. you know, but <laughs> the, I'm just hearing that. And I'm like, man, warning signs all, but look again, I, it's, it's good advice to focus on yourself. Like I told you to, that's always going to pay you dividends. And it's okay. good advice to have a real serious look and contemplation and talk with her about the viability of this. Those are the two things I would definitely sure. address. And the one thing, when you said the viability of it is, I would make sure that you're having the conversation of what does this look like and, and having a conversation around the expectations that you guys have about each other. And let's be frank, I would address, I, if you were going to have a relationship with her, you got to address the issue. Like, don't, don't, it's like, Oh, reset. No, no, no. Wait, let's be frank here. Yeah, You point. guys just destroyed trust with one another in a very substantial way. If you don't address why that happened, and how you guys were able to commit to each other into marriage and then bail on each other, you, you got to address that. Otherwise, yeah. that shit's just going to happen again. So don't brush that under the rug and like, okay, we're all good now. It's like, actually, you're not. You didn't address the issue. And, and, if, you, and if she's not willing to have that conversation, then worst case, you need to address that issue. Why did you do that? And if the answer is like, because she did, that's bullshit. That's you still need to address it because you're out of integrity. So you need to address why you went out of integrity. I agree. And get yourself in integrity. I think if you're in integrity, you have more room to stand on. And I think you're going to be a lot more clear too totally. about whether or not you want this relationship to continue. Cause I can't imagine being a man of integrity 
Like you're doing everything that you need to do. You're doing everything right. You're not stepping out. You're being faithful. You're honoring your word. You're committed to her. You're committed to your kids. And then she goes out and, and is that way. I think that becomes a more, a, an easier decision to make totally. <laughs> if you're completely in integrity. So maybe there's the issue. Maybe yeah. you're clouded because you're not in integrity. Yeah. Oof. Tough situation tough nonetheless. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Well, and I'm glad he's in the IC with us, right? So lean on your battle team and, you know, work through this and, and communicate this to them, obviously, not just to us, right. you know, for the yeah, podcast, but this, sh this should be a conversation within your, your battle brothers, with your battle brothers. So, yep. All right. Let's, let's jump over to Facebook, um, facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Uh, Jack, this is a question actually from last week and, and I skipped it obviously because I have no response and it's really kind of geared towards you very uh, specifically, Ryan, but he says, what are three ways to make money while having a podcast? What, what are some strategies around um, making it as a, a stream of income? I never really considered the podcast a revenue source. A Use lot, that a from lot of, a marketing. Kind it's of, more of a marketing yeah. funnel. Um, so you guys will hear us talk about the events or the iron council or our merchandise. And so it becomes a marketing division like email would be your direct ads or something. It becomes a okay. marketing component. That's how I've always looked at podcasting. You can make money directly from podcasting uh, through advertising. And that, that's how that would work. But you need to have a very large audience to make any sort of money. We do at this point, and I can make a lot more money, five figures a month, if I was selling ads, which we don't, right? So there's two ad models in podcasting. The first model is an affiliate model where um, let's say ABC company, let's say there's a hat company and they wanted me to sell their hats for every hat, for every $25 hat I sold, I made $2 on it. Got it. That's an affiliate model. Um, it works well with courses too. Like some guy will come in, he's like, Hey, I have a, a four week course on self-confidence. It's $500. And for every person you refer that signs up for this course, you're going to make 50 bucks. That's an affiliate model. There's the other ad model where it's, I will pay you per listener. And so there's a formula that's used and, and they'll say, you know, I'll pay you X amount of dollars, $20 per listener that you have per read that you do. And it's just a formula. Whether you sell anything or not is irrelevant. It's just an ad. And that's another way to make money podcasting. Outside of that, there's a lot of different ways. There's physical products. So that would be hats, shirts, merchandise, battle planners, that sort of thing. Uh, there's coaching is another opportunity. If you have a skill set in something, you could coach. Uh, I also consider consulting, which is similar to what you do, actually, Kip, is more of a consulting basis. That's coaching, consulting. Uh, you could sell digital assets. So that might be an ebook or an online course. You can offer memberships, which is what the Iron Council is. You pay X amount of dollars a month and you make this much money. Uh, you can offer events, which is also something we do. Main event, legacy, uprising, these sorts of things. Uh, and then I think I covered it. Those are the ways that you make money in this space, in this environment. And we make money doing all of those things. Yeah. I was going to say, I think you've thought about this before. So yeah, of go. course. I mean, th this is crucial. Like it's always interesting when people say, well, you know, Ryan, aren't you doing this out of the goodness of my heart? Well, yes, I am. And I also like making, make, making money doing it. It's an awesome not that you can align other. those two things. Yeah. Yeah. And I need money to be able to do this at a, at a greater capacity. You get, you remember when we started the iron council, yeah. it's a shell. It was a shell of what it is now, but I needed financial capital to be able to build it to what it is now. Right. If I attempted to do this where it is now without the resources, it just would have flopped. So there's a lot of different ways to make money and we tap into all of them. Yeah. Tristan Schinzel, what is the next big issue you'd like the Supreme Court to address? I thought this question's about <laughs> um, or, or, well, go ahead. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think too much about it. Actually. I think abortion was obviously the big issue and I, and I believe they got that one, right. People are up in arms. My thought is, Hey, look, it's people. I've, I've heard people say that uh, democracy is under attack. I'm like, no, actually it just we, happened. It's better. <laughs> no, it's moving closer to, yeah. to 
more of a, a Republic where yeah. it's going to the States and then States can vote and enact laws based on what their voters want. Like, I don't, I don't think here in rural Maine, we're going to generally vote like Southern Californians do. So why should Southern Californians dictate what rural Mainers do? Oh. They shouldn't. So it's actually more, repub- more of a Republic than it was just three days ago when Roe v. Wade was still intact. Yeah. Um, well, that's why I like this question by Tristan is because it's like, well, the Supreme Court didn't address it. The Supreme Court said we shouldn't be addressing it. Right. This is not and because us, it's not a this constitutional, is not a constitutional, thing. constitutional thing. So it, we shouldn't have been playing in the sandbox to begin with. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, there was some some victories uh, with a with a, uh, if I understand correctly, and I'm not well versed in this, so forgive me, but uh, I think that the state of New York had put a law in place or enacted some sort of legislation that said that concealed carry holders needed to have, a, and I don't know the exact terminology, but a viable or a legitimate reason as to why to carry a concealed carry in, yeah. in the state of New York. And the Supreme Court struck that down. I think that's a win for the Second Amendment rights yeah. because it doesn't say in the Constitution that you need to have a reason to carry a firearm it's very clear. Like, I, you, I don't, Shall I don't really infringed. think, Period. yeah, I really don't yeah. think you need to be a constitutional scholar to understand some of these things, but I, I would actually love to see concealed carry um, basically available at, in any state everywhere. But again, it's going to be up to each state to, yeah. to dictate that. So, but I, I don't think that any state should have any sort of concealed carry requirement or, or permit or anything like that. It should just be open for everybody. I, I feel Ryan, let me, let me know what you think of this because I, I don't know. I just feel inclined to saying this, that we, we need to be, I, I think so many people are puppets to political dialogue, right? They're up in arms. Why? Because someone said I was supposed to be up in arms because I've associated yeah. myself with a, with a political group and and I, I've, I've handed over my logical thinking to, and then I just, I latch on to whatever the thing is. It's like, you're, you're, we are, we, cause even I get sucked into things. We are often being asked to be puppets for someone else in an attempt to be controlled. And I really do believe that. I think a lot of the political parties and, and news outlets for that matter, generate tons of hype because they want you to be fired up because that allows them to, you know what I mean? point the finger and make another party bad. And, and, and just, I don't know, I, I, at least my suggestion and my thought is own your emotional opinion, logically think it's not as simple as a headline, understand the details before being so quickly to jump on the bandwagon of some, you know, talking point without no logical understanding on your own, or at least thinking it through on your own side of things. Yeah. I don't think you're wrong, but I think it is also important to be involved. And, I, and I'm not saying that you're yeah. saying we shouldn't. I, I don't think. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. But there are people and I and I see it and I've even made comments like this where it's, you know, just just wake up and work out and love your wife and be good and everything will work out. I'm like, well, that's cute, yeah. but that's not reality either. Yeah. You know, like we can't just bury our heads in the sand and live in our own little our own little system and think that the and world around us is going to operate correctly. Like sure. we do have to get involved. I had a good conversation with, uh, with a friend of mine, Ian, he owns Patriot gear and he had made a comment about freedom, how he, he thinks we should be free to, he doesn't agree with abortion, but free to choose abortion, free to, to choose to drink or do drugs. And I said, look, man, like, I don't agree with that. Like everybody has a limit on freedom. Everybody. Like there's nobody out there who believes that we should have freedom for everything. There's not a soul out there who believes that we all have lines, right? And that, and that line might be abortion or it might be gun rights, or it might be murdering, or it might be speeding, but everybody has a line that you're not free to do X, Y, and Z, whatever that is for you. And we had a really good discussion about, about that line. And he said, well, should, should we respect that people have the right to do it? And I said, well, it really just depends what you mean by respect. If you mean that people do have the right to get an abortion because it's not illegal, then I guess, yes, that's true. 
but if you mean I should, I should honor and celebrate and fight for that right for them to have an abortion. No, I'm certainly not going to do that. Why would I do that? In fact, I have a moral obligation and responsibility to fight for legislation and morality. And they're not always the same that I believe is in the best interest of me, my family, the people I care about and the citizens of this country. And he said, you know, again, very respectful discussion because him and I are friends and, and we think highly of each other. At least I think highly of him. I don't know if he thinks highly of me. I don't want to put words <laughs> in his mouth. Um, you know, and, he, and he's like, well, yeah, but, but, you know, we don't want to infringe on people's rights. And it's like, just because I say that a person shouldn't do a certain thing or shouldn't be, behave a certain way, that doesn't mean that I'm infringing upon their rights. It means that I have an opinion about it and I have a, every right to share it. And I should be sharing it because I would like the direction of the country to go in this direction. And you don't have to agree with it. And so you might want it to go in that direction. Neither one of us has to be quiet. I can yeah. think you're wrong and you can think I'm wrong. And I could, I could vehemently defend my position and you could do the same. And both of us are well, well within our rights and our responsibility as citizens of this country. Yeah. And the, the, the absence of that conversation and the coddling of other people's opinions and making sure we don't offend them is far greater of an issue than us having dialogue and debating and discussing. Yeah. I just think there's too many people who are like, well, you're just trying to shut down dissenting opinions. I'm like, no, I just think you're an idiot. Yeah. Like I'm not trying to shut it down, but if you called me an idiot, I wouldn't say that you're trying to shut down a conversation. You just think I'm an idiot period. And that's okay. You can think that. Yeah. But I don't think that you're trying to shut down. I don't think there's any sort of great threat to democracy by you calling me an idiot. I don't think we should be throwing those insults around. I think we should debate the issue, not the, the person's character necessarily, unless that's the question. But um, yeah, it's people are so quick to, well, you're just trying to shut down my opinion. Well, that's just your, yeah, okay. Like, let's not be so fragile. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, Christopher William Baker, hardest part about Brazilian jiu-jitsu for you personally? I don't know. I don't train anymore. So <laughs> um, This movement right here is kind of the yeah, hardest. Yeah, pushing. No, it's more of the butterfly. The butterfly movement. Is out here? Yeah. Yeah. The hardest part of jiu-jitsu. Are we talking about psychological oh, okay. or we're talking about like the physical part of the game? I don't know. We could do both. For me, the okay. psychological is not seeing improvement fast enough. That's the hardest part for me. Yeah. Like there's, there's psychologically, I, I'm not, I don't get concerned about going. I'm not scared. I don't, I, there's no apprehension about it. Like there, none of that. And maybe there was when I started, but, and I haven't been training a long time, three plus years. Um, that's just not an issue. But the hardest part for me is like psychologically, like, gosh, dang, I'm not getting as good as I would like as quickly as I would like. And that can be very frustrating. What, what would you yeah. say from a psychological standpoint? I always thought jujitsu has these highs and lows, right? Like you can be on a high and you're like, man, I'm training great. I feel great. I'm, you know, dominating on the mat a little bit. Like you, you just have some high confidence yeah. and it just always feels that you can feel that way one day. And then the next day you just get your ass handed to you by everybody. And then it's just crazy? like, damn, I suck. Right. So, so being okay, you know, I guess the, um, what's that old biblical, it's not actually biblical. I always think it's a biblical phrase, but the, you know, this too shall pass having that mentality that like being okay with wherever you are. And if you're in the dip, then that's okay. And, and not making it mean something. I, I have intensity when I'm in that dip, I'm just like, I stack it I on and I just feel this. super bad about myself. And I, I, I just hate where I'm at. Um, so I just need to be like content in the moment. Just realize that's part of the journey. I think ours are actually very closely aligned. Yeah. Well, you know, I it's think because it's I, naturally, cause we want to be good at whatever it is that we're doing. Yeah. But, the, but the alternative is you would be so like, you just wouldn't care about it at all. And that's not the right attitude either. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right. Cause you don't want to be like, ah, you know, I just got my whatever. Ass no big deal. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Like, kind of is it's a big like, deal. It is you a big deal. Like, if yeah. you want to get better, then you have to be upset about that. 
but not yeah. so upset that you sabotage yourself, but just yeah. upset enough that you keep coming back to try to continue to learn. So maybe so I we're think perfect if, the way we are. I don't know. I think if you're going to, yeah, well, you are. I think if, <laughs> I think if you're going to err on the side of, of something that it should be aspirational, like, Oh, I want to be yeah. better. And you should be a little frustrated that you're not getting better as, yeah. as quickly as you'd like. To your point, it's what causes you to show up of a little bit more powerfully. Next time you're in the gym, you might intentionally do some drills now and some other things because you didn't like that feeling. Right. I mean, I even think about it with this, what I'm dealing with for the next three to four months is like, I fully plan on stretching. I plan on eating right. I plan on watching videos. I plan on getting back into it when I can, like to, to a small degree and, and build from there because I really want to be good at jujitsu. I really enjoy yeah. it. And I take pride in being decent for where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, physically, what's hard rolling against Pete Roberts is <laughs> insanity. Well, what's and you a, know what's the... I'm, I'm bet Christopher's asking like position, like what's yeah. your weak spots of your game? Maybe I tend to let people pass my guard and settle in more than I would like them to do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Like I kind of, I think I give up too soon and I'm like, Oh, they passed. And it's like, did they though? Or did you let them pass? Yeah. Like and I there was some still fight in you. You could have swing. And I just kind of let them settle. Distance. Yeah because I actually don't mind people being in my side control that that doesn't really bother me too much. Yeah. I, f I feel okay right there. Um, and so I think there could have been probably some things I could have done, like fought scramble just a little bit more to stay out from letting somebody get into my side. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I have a little bit of that. I also have, I'll, I'll get deflated when I've, when I fought really hard to pass a guard mm. and I'm fighting, I'm fighting. And then they recover. And there's Real a moment quick. of like, uh, you know yeah. what I mean? Versus yeah. if I kind of that same thought, if I just pushed a little bit more, I could have gotten it, but I'm like, I get deflated when I've like tried so hard and I didn't, I didn't pass. Yeah. Kind of the same issue. Really. It's like this mental, like, ah, oh, darn versus no, I, I could have fought a little bit more and maybe yeah. prevented it and or got it yeah i don't really know where like when to when to go hard and scramble hard and when to just flow and relax for a minute i i haven't found that yeah place yeah and i think it's probably different for different of course training partners. different style different yeah. partners different styles absolutely yeah yeah for sure i've gotten i've created some bad habits for sure like where i'll i'll be like i'll, I'll i like to attack from awkward positions when someone does have me in side control. So yeah. I, I give up side control all the time from a competition mm. perspective, stupid idea. Not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bad habit to get yourself into. So I, I do that a little too much in training where I, I kind of have these bad habits. It's like my passive aggressive jujitsu doesn't serve itself very well outside of training, but. Yeah. I mean, it's great in training, right? Cause you put yourself yeah. in a the, the, the thing I would say on offense, so that's more of a defensive for me. The thing I'd say on offense is I have a tendency of laying on people because I like yeah. a pressure game. I like a close yeah. pressure game and I'm big and strong enough that I can bully people around like that a little bit. Yeah. Unless they're super technical or, or the same size as me and it's going to be harder, yeah. but I do have a tendency of, of laying on people instead of creating space and opportunities and gaps to attack. That's one thing mm. I can work on. Like you'll settle there a little too much versus, yeah. you know, chest to chest, just put the pressure on, which works sometimes, you know, and it's yeah. like, well, maybe I ought to go into knee on belly and set up something with the arm or set up something with the neck or try to take their back. And it's like, Nope, I'm good right here. Yeah. Yeah. See, I get a little impatient when I do that. I'm like, okay, I'm bored, you know, <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> so I'll like I, give up stuff, you know? Yeah. I'm but. just like, oh, I can just pin them here and, I'm, I'm in control. It's like, Make okay, well, yeah, you are in control, yeah. but are you getting better? No, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. All right. Graham Helder. I recently moved halfway across the country. I'm having difficulty approaching men in my church and striking up conversations in my old church. I grew up with everyone, but now I feel like an outsider. How do I beat that social anxiety and engage with my peers? You don't beat it. You own it. Hmm. So what I mean is if I were at a new church and I'm like, oh, I feel really uncomfortable and awkward, but I'm going to pretend like I'm not 
that's trying to beat it and you you're fooling yourself. And then it just comes across as disingenuous. So instead yeah. of that, what I would suggest to you is that you own it. And so you might approach the guys and maybe they have, I don't know, Sunday school, or maybe they have a meeting each week is, is you just own it. And you go to the guys, whoever the head of the thing is, and you say, Hey, Kip, I know you're in charge of the men's group. And it sounds like you guys meet every Wednesday night. I'm new here. I don't know a single person. I feel really awkward, but Hey man, like, would you mind if I tagged along with you guys? Totally. And you just, you just own it. And like, what's he going to do? No, no, no. We don't want more men, more righteous men here learning about God and the gospel and hanging out and and having this fellowship. Like you're in a no threat environment. So just be humble. Just own the fact that you feel awkward or you feel stupid or you don't know somebody, or maybe you even put something together. Maybe it's like, Hey, fight Saturday night at seven o'clock. Kip, I know you're in charge of the men's group. Um, I, I wanted to have four or five guys. Over. I don't have much room for more than that, but I've got a bunch of steaks. Uh, my wife's going to be on the grill. We're going to do this. And then there's this, like, would you want to get a couple of guys together from the church? It would totally do that, but totally. just own it. Yeah. Don't you're, I think you're making a bigger deal of it than you need to. And that's, what's creating the barrier and the blockage for you. Yeah. And, and I think there's a little bit of who's, who's this about you? Like maybe, maybe get over that and just say, Hey, you know what? These are good guys. I want to serve them and, and maybe find a little bit stronger purpose than just you and how you look. And that sometimes will help guys uh, take the necessary action because it's, it is bigger than you. It's about your family. It's about your wife. It's about how you guys integrate in the community. Like it's bigger than just your anxiety. So maybe put some weight on it a little bit. I like what you said about the way you look. Cause isn't that the root of it is like, I don't want to be awkward around these guys. Well, you're, yeah. you're like, you're the one that's thinking that. Yeah. Like no, very few people are actually, other people are actually thinking that. Yeah. They're more concerned about how they're looking to you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. They're not concerned about what you think. Yeah. Right. Or they're not concerned about your perception of them. They're more concerned about the other. Right. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take one All more. Right. All right. Jimmy bars. What criteria do you have that has met that? has that has to be met before you would consider yourself wealthy. I don't, I don't care about that. Yeah. What, like, I mean, I, that isn't uh, like, there's nothing. Like not why, a, what's the value of considering yourself wealthy? There's no metric for that for me. Like, I don't, like, yeah. Oh man, I want to be wealthy. And I want, like, I don't care about that. Yeah. I, I have a thought and, and I've okay. shared this before. Um, and it's a quote, it's the book that you're quoted in one of your old time guests, like a long time ago, probably in like the first year from or two, Austin, Austin Netsley, something wealth book, right? Yeah. I can't remember what it is. I'm listening. Uh, I just got to shut this yeah. door. My little guy opened it up. So I'm listening. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So in that book, one of the things I loved, if I, if I had to paraphrase, and this is from years and years ago was he suggested that you need to define what wealth is because otherwise you'll end up just chasing this elusive dollar. And, and we use this example all the time. Like when we'll do an event and say, okay, everyone raise your hand that wants to be a millionaire and everyone raises their hand, but then you go, okay, well, here's what's required. Now who still wants to be a millionaire, right? So there's some value in you being very clear of why you want or what are the expectations or what's required to actually get somewhere. And sometimes when we chase the dollar, we lose sight if we didn't have clarity of why we really cared about the dollar. And so as an example is I've asked my wife and said, hey, what does really wealthy look like to you? And it was funny because she was like being able to go to Europe whenever I want, maybe a couple of times a year and be able to be over there for a month. And I'm like, well, that's less to do with money and more to do with flexibility of time. So yeah. It's probably a really good idea that I know that. So I'm not just nine to five grinding it out to make tons of money and have zero flexibility. So I think it's just important to maybe have the conversation, what is wealthy, but what's behind that, right? What does wealthy really mean to you? So then that way we're taking the necessary action, not necessarily just chasing a dollar. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and, you know, in, in that light, I would say for me, um, there, they're, they're not real tangible. I have tangible objectives because that's what we do in the Iron Council. Yeah. We come up with our battle plan. I have those objectives. Um, but, you know, this afternoon, I'm taking this entire afternoon off. Like when we're done, I'm done. I'm going to upload it and let Chad 
edit the video and edit, edit the audio. And I'm not doing anything else. It's 12, 15 here, you know, so I'm going to take the afternoon off. I'm in a pretty good position. Why? Because I don't feel good. <laughs> I want to take the day off. First, I want to go take a nap. I want to sleep for an hour. And then I want to, yeah. you know, hang out with the kids. And that's a pretty good life to me. You know, oh, yeah. I, I don't need to chase anything else outside of that. Um, so maybe I already am wealthy, you know, and yeah. I'm good with that. I have a brother that um, I don't think he listens and, and it shouldn't be an attack. This is a compliment that financially it, it, on paper, you would say that he's struggling, right? In a very bad position or whatever. But you ask him about how life is and how wealthy and blessed he is. And life is great. Yeah. Because he spends a lot of time with his kids, his family, and he has what he wants. And that right. is a well-lived life from his perspective. And so maybe in paraphrasing, be clear, why do you care about wealthy and maybe replace wealthy with what's important to you and just yeah. make sure that whatever you're doing is in line with, with that higher purpose and that those things that are more important. I, you know, I even think about it from the, from the, now that we're kind of fleshing this out a little bit from the, from the uh, money perspective, I, I do want to make more money because money is a metric of value. That's, that's yeah. how I define money. It's a metric of perceived. I say, I say it this way. Money is a metric of perceived value. And I say perceived because you have to believe that it's valuable to give me your money and what, whatever you're getting in return is more valuable than the money you're giving me. Totally. So if I make half a million dollars this year, then that's the perceived value that the people received. If I make a million dollars this year. Then, then you're more valuable that, than you were last year. And it's not even about being more valuable at this point in my life. It's that I just serve twice as many people, or I serve the same amount of people twice as much. Got it. And so I, I look at measure of impact. That's all it is. I look at the, and there's other ways to measure that, but that's just one of the ways that I measure it. And I look at it and I'm like, okay, well, we're doing pretty good. We're impacting a lot of people. How do we impact more? Or if we're going to raise prices at, at an event, for example, what will justify that price increase? Okay, well, we have to do X, Y, and Z. Good, let's do that. And that's going to warrant the increase in price. So I, I, I know not everybody's in this situation. I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm keenly aware of that because I've been there. All of us have. Uh, and, and I know at some point, it's just like, I just got to make money to put food on the table. And sure. I, I passed that concern a long time ago. And I'm blessed and I'm fortunate. I'm grateful that I have because I was there and it's totally. miserable. Yeah. But that's just different than where I'm at right now. And, and I want all of us to get to that point. Totally. Totally. And one way to get to that point, get on the court and play the game in the Iron Council. So to learn more about the Iron Council, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. We're going to be open for until the end of this week. Yeah. Three so, more days is it. Yeah. And then we're going to close this, uh, that door. And you're going to have to wait until next quarter. So if you're on the fence, just execute. And, and I, my suggestion is, and I, I mentioned this on a, a podcast a couple, maybe it was last week or the week before. And I, and I really like, I'm not joking in this strategy. Um, if you feel like, Hey, for me to execute on this, I, I need to get my wife on board or, or I need to get on board. Then the way you approach this is get clear why it's important how you're going to level up by executing and then what are you going to do to make it worth it yeah like good point set those boundaries with yourself like okay for me to justify join the iron council this is where i want to be then make it happen like literally define it and make it happen and and join us once again that's orderofman.com slash iron council kip I, I that was really great i would add one other thing to that is make sure if you're including your wife in the process and you probably should yeah um that you're also checking in with her. So at the end of the first month, you're like, Hey, hon, you remember I joined the iron council. Um, I, I just joined a team. Here's what I'm doing. Here's how, it, but what, what do you think about the way I've showed up over the past 30 days and ask her, like, you're not asking for permission. A lot of guys will hear that and be like, Oh, you're being a beta. Yeah. No, you're just, you're including her in the process. Cause she does have a vested interest in the process. She has a vested interest in you. So help her see that. And what I would say is just 
I was going to say, give me 90 days. Don't give me 90 days. Just give yourself 90 days. We operate in quarters, okay? 90 day segments. We have a 12 week battle planner and we operate those 12 weeks. That's 90 days. Give yourself 90 days. You guys, some of you are doing 75 hard. Some of you are doing this and that. Just 90 days. And 90 days from now, you can evaluate it. And if I guarantee, I can promise you that if you've done the work for 90 days consistently, religiously, that it, it's going to be well, well worth it. It's incalculable what it'll be worth to you Amen. if you do it for 90 days. Totally. Even if you leave after 90 days, it's still going to be incalculable because you're going to take all that information and knowledge and you're going to implement it and compound it over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Yep. So check it out. Orderman.com slash Iron Council. Well, Kip, I appreciate you. I know my energy was probably a little down today. Um, I'm going to go take a nap and take the <laughs> afternoon off. <laughs> And uh, I'll be back tomorrow, but uh, appreciate you. Appreciate all the questions, guys. Good questions today. A lot of new ones. And uh, we'll be back on Friday for our Friday field notes. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.